shortest reading assignment with it and also the shortest homework assignment. It really is just one section of chapter 37, 37.7. So you get a little bit of a break in terms of like your reading and everything. There's of course a whole list of objectives. And even though it's just a couple pages of reading, I have managed to like drag it out across a whole lecture here. So you're welcome. Um, and, uh, but it's really an, an interesting and important topic, but keep in mind, it's a little bit easier. Oh yeah, that's right. I did have one more, I forgot, I had one more announcement. That is the, the homework that we do Monday morning. I think kind of understandably, there were a number of people that kind of spaced out on that one because you know it was, we had the exam and anyway. So I did extend Monday's homework for 24 more hours. So it's due tomorrow morning at 8.30. As soon as I did that, as soon as I entered that into matching bio, the average grade went up by like 10 points. So I think there were a lot of people that finished it late and now those scores have now been counted. So that's good. If you didn't, there's a bunch of people who didn't do chapter 46 homework. So that's now due tomorrow. You have 24 hour extension on that, okay? All right, so now we're thinking about plants and how they uh, you know, respond to things that want to eat them or exploit their nutrition. And I'm actually gonna start off, this is not this drawing here, you have it on, page 34 of your workbook. And this is not a plant cell, this is an animal cell. And what we're looking at is the surface of a, of a sensory cell in an animal. And there's a membrane receptor called TRP5 or TRPV, the V is the Roman numeral for five, that um, sits here in the membrane. It has like a lot of proteins, it has multiple conformations. And this is a, a cation channel. And uh, so it has a closed conformation and then it has an open conformation. So in its open conformation, it lets in calcium ions. So calcium has that positive charge. So calcium is gonna come in. And like a lot of sensory cells, this one has a negative resting membrane potential due to the sodium potassium pump. And so again, this is all familiar to you. So the calcium coming in is gonna cause the cell to depolarize, right? So that's going to lead to depolarization. That initiates an action potential on the surface of the cell. And then that is going to lead to a neuron, which eventually takes the signal up to the brain and through a long pathway that I'm not going to get into here, that leads to a sensation of pain. So this is a cell that is involved in, in you know, creating a, a, a pain sensation. So uh, pain sensing. All right, so the question is then, okay, what causes TRPV to open? Well, the main thing, the reason why TRP evolved and the main thing that causes it to open is uh, signals released by damaged cells, right? And that you want a pain response. If you have a bunch of damaged cells in an area, you want a pain response to be elicited. So TRP opens in response to signals from damaged cells. So that's the main one, right? However, there are a few other organisms out there that have evolved molecules, which will also bind to and activate or open this TRPV channel. One of them, interestingly, is uh, spider. Spider venom is another thing that will happen to uh, activate this. And there's a molecule in plants that actually Dr. Taylor kind of came up sort of naturally in one of her lectures earlier. There's also a plant molecule that opens this uh, channel and that is capsaicin. So this molecule that's associated with the heat in, in chili peppers, the capsaicin molecule also opens the TRPV channel. So, you know, when you eat chili peppers, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, you know, there's the five tastes, right? So sour, sweet, salty, um, uh, bitter and umami, right? So those are the five tastes. Spicy is not a taste, right? Spicy is a pain sensation that you experience when you put this on your, your tongue. So you could use sriracha, you could also use, you know, spider venom, I guess, if that's what you're into. So um, to spice up your food a little bit. This is the capsaicin molecule. You do not know you need to memorize it, but I just wanted to show you this. So this is able to bind onto a site sort of on the side of the TRPV receptor and cause it to open and you get that same pain sensation. All right, so uh, the, you might be familiar with the Scoville units, which is a way of measuring how much capsaicin there is in, uh, in peppers. It was uh, 
just it was made up by Wilbur Scoville in like 1904. Uh, he was a pharmacist and a perfume maker, but he also worked with chili peppers. And it's just a way of sort of giving an idea of how spicy these things are. Uh, just to give you an idea, you know, a jalapeno pepper, where are they? So here's jalapenos. They're, you know, sort of in the, depending on how hot it is, sort of the three to 8,000 Scoville unit range. So previously, the hottest pepper was this uh, Boot Jalukia in Wicro, India, and they have a million Scoville units. But then, of course, plant breeders got a hold of all these plants and tried to breed hotter ones. And so now the hottest one on record is the Carolina Reaper. Uh, which was made by a, a breeder in Carolina, and that had almost half a million Scoville units. So that's getting close to like actually, you know, pepper spray, which is also a, uh, which is also capsaicin. So you can go online, right, and see people doing like, you know, uh, these challenges and stuff like that, where they try and eat these Carolina Reapers. This guy who broke the record, 22 Carolina Reapers in 60 seconds. Um, <laughs> You'll notice that there's less alcohol here, but there's also a lot of milk down the front. And you might know this also from your own experience, right? That that if you have a really spicy thing in your mouth, drinking water doesn't really help you very much. But but something like sour cream or yogurt or milk actually does help. And that's if you look at the the capsaicin molecule, you can see it's got this big like hydrocarbon uh, tail on it, so it's hydrophobic on that end. And that's why you need something that has some fat in it to help kind of dissolve it. And that gets it away from those TRTB receptors and it starts to lower the pain sensation associated with that. You can buy capsaicin uh, in, a, in a drugstore in the form of this cream called capsaicin HP. And this is actually used as a treatment for uh, especially like joint pain and arthritis. So what it, it, you know, if you, you, you obviously wouldn't want to put this on like an open wound or something or put it in your eyes or your mouth. But if you rub it on your skin, some of that capsaicin get through and what it does is it sort of gently stimulates some of these pain receptors and over time that can lead to a desensitization of those pain receptors. So this is a, a, a medical application, uh, you know, a, a sort of a topical uh, pain reliever that you can use. Now, so why do peppers make these hot, you know, why do peppers make these? Uh, well, interestingly, one of the, um, there's some evidence here that the main reason that peppers started to make capsaicin is actually as a defense against not an herbivore, uh, like a large animal or something like that, but actually as a defense against uh, fungus. Um, if you, you know, if chilies tend to grow in places that are kind of hot and wet where fungus easily takes hold and, um, what they found is that chili peppers that are infected by fungus, they increase their amount of capsaicin in the fruits. Um, and also the hotter and wetter the environment is that the, cat, that the pepper is growing in, the more of the capsaicin that will make. And so that may be evolutionarily what's driven capsaicin is actually defense against a fungal uh, pathogen. And here's a slide I threw in just because Dr. Taylor mentioned this too. So birds, you know, are the main distributor of the seeds in peppers. And they do have the TRPV receptor. They can definitely sense pain, but it's not activated by the capsaicin molecule like, like ours is, right? And it turns out, I, I discovered this yesterday. So here's the amino acid sequence of TRPV from uh, chicken. Gallus gallus is the uh, uh, genus and species of chicken. And it turns out that the really critical amino acid is this one alanine right here. If, so you can isolate this protein from chicken and you can, you know, this is done not in a living chicken, but in like a cell culture thing. And if you, you know, if you have this on the surface of a cell, you treat it with capsaicin, nothing happens. If you change that alanine to a different amino acid, specifically a glutamic acid, so just change that one amino acid, then treat it with capsaicin, then calcium starts flowing. So it's basically like this probably a single nucleotide mutation or something that led to a single amino acid change in the protein that rendered uh, birds insensitive to the, the, the heat of capsaicin. Anyway. All right. So that was a long intro. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, like, there's different ways that plants can defend themselves against the environment. And capsaicin here is an example of what we call uh, an innate immunity. So in other words, something that you're born with is there all the time. And you know, as you can see up here, it includes barriers you know, that just prevent pathogens or herbivores from getting to the nutritious parts of the plant. So you know, the, the wax and cork and bark and thorns and things like that. And then there's also chemicals. Capsaicin is one of them, but I'm going to let you read in the textbook about others because there's a lot of really interesting 
uh, things that you'll be familiar with. Either they are, you know, flavorings that we use in food because <laughs> even though you know they're, they're, we, we like the taste of them, and also a lot of things that are associated with uh, with narcotics and things like opium and stuff. Opio opioids are these chemicals that, that plants make to defend themselves. So that's all I'm really going to say about innate immunity. But you'll read a little bit more about some of the interesting molecules that are involved in that. So now we're going to move on to think about the next, the uh, the more the bigger issue, which is acquired immunity. And by the way, this might be useful later because plant animals also have both innate and, or, and acquired immunity as well. And so this table is kind of setting you up to do a comparison later on. All right, so clear your mind for a moment and uh, imagine a tree and not don't think like a palm tree or something like that. Imagine like you're in a fairy tale or a fantasy book or something like that. It's a summer day and you, there's this big hill and up on the top of the hill, there's a tree there. So picture that tree in your mind. You got it? Okay. You're probably, if I had to guess, you're probably picturing something like this, like this big, beautiful sort of spreading tree. This is a picture of an American chestnut. So these were really big trees. They were really very, very common in the United States, especially uh, in the Eastern part of the United States. Um, and I would love to be able to show you a color picture of an American chestnut. And a mature one like this, but I can't. They're all gone now, all killed by a pathogen. Um, it was called the, the chestnut blight. So it's a, this is a fungal pathogen, and it doesn't kill the whole tree. What it does is it gets inside the tree and it exploits a small region in the, the trunk. Now, I have this little drawing over here just to remind you about some stuff from earlier on in the class, right? So this is a cross section of the stem of a, of a plant. That black circle represents the vascular cambium. And remember that all of the living cells that are really important for, uh, you know, moving nutrients up and down through the tree, they're all in that outer, you know, just in the outer couple millimeters of that plant, right? You've got the vascular cambium, you have the phloem, you have the cells that are, are turning into xylem cells that are differentiating into xylem. They're all right there around the edge. And so this, this fungus gets in there and it basically infects those cells and it creates this little dead zone in the in the, the trunk and that's going to kill the entire tree right because it's going to disrupt the flow of of uh, of water up and down into the tree so this is what kills the the american chestnut okay now i have this so let me so the the fungus Arrived, so this, this shows the original range here in green of the American chestnut. Um, there were about, oops, how many? I have some numbers on this. There were about four, estimated to be about four billion of them in the United States here. And then you'll notice that the, the, the area of death sort of starts right there around Manhattan. And in fact, what it was was a plant that was brought to the, the um, Central Park Zoo, it was brought from Japan. Uh, for a special exhibit there, and this plant had a fungus in it that was able to infect the chestnut trees, and the chestnut trees had never been exposed to it. They didn't have any defense for this fungus. And so you can see over the next, you know, 40 years or so, that basically all the chestnuts were wiped out. There's still a few little green dots down there in the south where there are young stands of chestnuts that are growing, but for the most part, they're all, all gone. Now this is, this is just the website of the uh, group that's working to restore the chestnut. So they're doing a lot of breeding and biotechnology to try and bring the American chestnut uh, back. But so far, this tree that once really dominated the US landscape is pretty much all gone. All right, so this shows the important, you know, interaction between a plant, and in this case, a particular pathogen. Maybe you don't have a, a worksheet for this, but I just thought having a definition of a of pathogen would be helpful for you here. And you can fit it in anywhere in your worksheets. But, but basically, when we say a pathogen, and I think this is going to be true for plants and animals, we're talking about any disease causing agent. And I'm going to, a disease causing agent. Now, why am I not saying organism? Well, because this does include uh, viruses, which technically are not living things, right? They need other cells to reproduce. But you know, for us, especially with plants, we're going to think so. Certainly, bacteria and fungus, fungi, uh, are examples of these disease-causing agents. So basically, anything that can cause disease in a plant, and it, you know, and, and I say agent just because viruses technically are not living organisms. Okay. 
So here's another example of a, of a pathogen. And you do have this on, on uh, page 35 of the workbook. So this is another fungus. Um, it's called Phytophthora infestans, and it has had, you know, so my first example with the American chestnut shows, you know, how big of an effect a pathogen can have on a plant population. Here we can talk about the effect that these pathogens can have on human populations. So this would infect potatoes. It kills the above ground part of the potato and also the potatoes. So the potatoes in the field uh, were infected. The potatoes that were in people's uh, root cellars got infected as well. And this, uh, this fungus was basically able to, to kill all of those. So um, this fungus appeared in Ireland and it's responsible for the, the Irish potato famine, right? So at the time, many people, especially poor people in Ireland, their main source of calories was potatoes. And here's a little graph of the population of Ireland. And so this, uh, this uh, uh, fungus here is responsible for this, this big famine that took place. Um, about a million people, it's estimated, starved to death and about 4 million people left Ireland, many came to the United States. And so that's had a big effect on millions of people in the United States, including people here. If you have any sort of Irish uh, uh, descent in your family, it is very likely that your family story is tied in very closely with the appearance of this fungus and, uh, and the big mass uh, exodus from Ireland that it caused. So again, just some examples of these cases where you have you know, plants and there's a, a, a new pathogen uh, a fungus in this case that can come in and really quickly overwhelm all those plants. But this doesn't happen all the time because plants are able to defend themselves from these pathogens. So we're going to think now about that. And, and one of the main things that you're going to have to really kind of focus on with this lecture and this material is just some new vocabulary. You kind of have to keep straight. So I'm going to introduce it now and then give you a couple opportunities to practice it through learning catalytics during the rest of the lecture today. All right, so here we have two potato plants that have both been infected with a fungal pathogen. And then there's that question, which plant has the best chance of surviving? I think you can look at the pictures and it's kind of obvious there. Um, I used to have some different pictures where it wasn't quite as obvious. But I do want to point out, so here in this one, you can kind of see that you know, the fungus is not just covering the plant, but it's coming up from inside, right? It has gotten into the interior of the leaves where the mesophyll cells are and everything. And it is growing in there and, and coming out of the plant and everything as well. Now this one here looks pretty good, but I do want to point out these little uh, dots here on the leaf, right? So this was done in a laboratory where what the researchers did was they, you know, they took this fungal pathogen, they mixed it up in some water to make a solution of it, and then they just like put little dots of it on the leaf in a very controlled way. And so what we can see here is um, this, this one plant that's looking pretty good, it does have these little dead spots. Okay, so now for some vocabulary here. Um, we're going to have words that we used to describe the pathogen. And then we're also gonna have words that we use to describe the plant in all of these cases. So in this first case, where we obviously have disease, uh, the pathogen we would say is virulent. That just means able to cause disease. So virulent is able to cause disease. And the plant in this case is not resistant. Now, in the other one, where we do have this, uh, the plant overall, I mean, there, there is some death going on in the plant, but overall it looks pretty good. We would say that this pathogen in this case is avirulent, right? So A just means the opposite of virulent, unable to cause disease, and the plant is resistant. So just remember, we're gonna talk about the pathogens in terms of their virulence. Can they cause disease or not? Are they virulent or avirulent? We're going to talk about the plants in terms of resistance. Are they resistant to a particular pathogen or are they not resistant? Yeah. Is the pathogen um, virulent? <laughs> right, so there's a question about uh, about the plant pathogen relationship here. I would say just if like if you got this picture on an exam or something like that, you would have to conclude, okay, well, it can't be the same exact plant and the same exact pathogen in both pictures because there is specificity between the plant and the pathogen. So either these two plants are genetically distinct from each other, or we're using two different pathogens in the different pictures. So but if you're, the answer to your question is yes, there's going to be a very a lot of specificity between a plant and its pathogen in terms of these interactions. 
We'll think about the genetics in just a minute, okay? But that it all comes down to genes, and so we'll talk about those soon. All right, so now if we were to if we were to wind the clock ahead 24 hours on this picture, here's what our, our the plant that's not resistant, where the pathogen is virulent, this is what it would look like, right? All of those structures inside the basically there's gonna be a complete loss of trigger pressure in these cells as this plant sort of destroys the cell walls. So we're gonna get a lot of wilting. Here we can see a little chunk of stem where there's basically this fungus like oozing out of this stem, right? So basically this plant is completely overwhelmed, sorry, by this pathogen. Now with the other plant, the plant that's resistant, and here's another really important vocabulary word, it has actually been able to, to respond and deal with this infection before it gets serious. And what this plant is showing is called the hypersensitive response. So we're going to use the abbreviation HR for this throughout the whole lecture. So the hypersensitive response, we'll talk about it biochemically a little bit more later, but for right now, what you need to know is basically it's like localized cell death. To first of all, contain what was the word I wanted to use here? Hold on just a second. Yeah, contain and ultimately destroy the pathogen. So these little dead spots on that leaf are really important things because what's happened there is a place where the pathogen has landed on the leaf, the plant has recognized that the pathogen is there and it has quickly moved to, to limit the spread of that pathogen and it does it by sacrificing some of its own cells so this is different than the way our immune system is going to work right we have special cells that go in and attack the pathogen but plants you know and this is part of the reason for the way plants grow right they are they can keep generating new tissue throughout their life so for a plant it makes sense to just sacrifice some tissue if you can take that pathogen out with it so again a lot more detail about the hypersensitive response later but that's the idea is this localized cell death of the plant cells to contain and ultimately destroy the pathogen. All right, so here's just some other pictures. You don't have this in your workbook, but I, I thought this was great too. As you can see here, you know, the plant at the top is resistant. You've got these little dead spots that form on it, but then the infection doesn't spread. Whereas here, a plant that's not resistant, you know, you can see in those same days that the, that, that, that fungus is going to totally overwhelm the plant and you know just consume all of the tissue. So spots on plants it's a good thing right so you, if you if, if you're at the farmer's market and there's an apple there that has a little spot on it you're like Ugh, i'm not gonna buy that but remember that is a that is a very healthy plant right so spots on plants we tend to associate it with like a, a problem but from the plant perspective that is the best possible outcome for after being infected by some kind of pathogen from the environment so those little those little dead spots they're evidence of the hypersensitive response okay all right, so let's get another learning catalytic question going here, because now I've just introduced some, some new vocabulary. And I'm going to give you a chance to think about this one here. So it's a fig leaf. So the, the question is active right now. The session number's up there. So it's a fig leaf. And doing the same thing I just described, right? The researchers, they took um, different bacteria in this case, right? So each circle here is a different bacterium. So it's obviously the same leaf. But we have different bacteria. And so we've got eight different bacteria that were spotted on the leaf. And so which ones would, based on their number, would be correctly described as virulent? In other words, able to cause disease. Go ahead, give me some time to log on, think about this, talk to people around you, and we'll see what you, what you like. So it's challenging you to apply this new vocabulary that I've given you. All right. We've almost got everybody in here. So five, four, three, two, 
one. Okay. So um, let me stop this. I'm going to give you another attempt on this question right here because most people and, I, and this is totally understandable right so most people went with i'm going to i'm going to uh, with an incorrect answer i'm going to take that answer off of the table right now so go ahead and i'm going to eliminate possibility a and so i want you to try again here's the same question so go ahead and uh try again and if you're changing your answer this time i want you to see if you can think about okay why did I choose that first answer? And it probably makes sense, like the way the leaf looks here, right? So now think about the second answer. Okay, how are you? What, you know, if you change, I thought you were going to change your answer. So see if you can think about why that is and uh, see if you can explain that to somebody next to you. Why is uh, A not the correct answer for this one? Almost everybody went for A on the first one. Not the, not the best answer to this question, so. Let's see how we're doing this time around. Okay, looking much better. Give you another uh, 10 seconds here. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Good. All right. So this time, uh, people shifted their answer over to to B, which is the best answer here. And I realize this is very it's very counterintuitive. So first of all, a few people did go with C, but no, not all bacteria are virulent, right? So. Not all bacteria are able to infect the plant. In fact, we see here that these bacteria are affecting the plant differently. So maybe somebody can tell me why, like answer A, one, one, five, or six. What, what do you, from looking at the picture, why is that, why would we uh, not choose that one? Yeah, go ahead. Right, so the sort of light color that you see in those circles indicates that cell death has happened, right? So those cells have died. Other one, a nice looking green here. This it's going to be able to, to cause disease in the
you for pointing that out. Okay, good. Hey, people on Zoom, thank you. I, I was muted and I dropped off Zoom for a minute, but I think we're back right now. So sorry about that. And thanks for your patience. Okay, so we're talking about some of the genetics that underlie this response to the plant. So we're going to first start thinking about the, the plants. And um, so in this picture here, these two plants that we're starting on, though the leaf looks the same, these two are genetically distinct from each other. So there's some difference in genotype. I mean, they're the same species because we want to do a cross with them later. But there's two, you know, there, there's a genetic difference between these two plants. And we can see that because here, if we infect them with a, um, let's just, let, just to make it more sense for later, let's just use a bacterial pathogen for these. So we're going to infect them with the same bacteria. And what you can see is that one of them is resistant, right? So these little spots represent the hypersensitive response. So this plant has sensed and responded to the pathogen. Whereas this one here, you know, so this plant would, we would say is uh, resistant. And this plant over here is not resistant, right? So it's wilting and dying. Okay. So what we're going to think about now is what if we do a cross between these, right? So we're just going to breed these two individuals, you know, after doing this experiment, maybe on just one leaf, right? We can still have the rest of the plant and we could do an experiment with that. And so if we cross them together, we're going to get an F1. And then that F1, we're going to let it self-pollinate. And here's what we see in the next generation, right? Is we see a, a nice Mendelian three to one ratio of, you know, uh, resistant to not resistant. All right, I don't have a learning title and expression about this one, but maybe just think for a minute about what does that tell you? All right, so we have a, a very simple genetic experiment across between a resistant plant and a plant that is resistant. We let that F1 self pollinate. We see a three to one ratio here in the next generation. You should be able to say, at a genetic standpoint, what, is that, what does that mean? Maybe, you know, share, write it in your notes or share with somebody next to you. What, what do we take from, from this? What have we learned by this genetic experiment? Let's take a moment to think that first. Okay. Okay, so that's, so this is kind of looking at it from the plant side. Now we're going to do um, a slightly different sort of experiment, still a genetic experiment, because we're going to be manipulating genes. But here we're going to manipulate the genes, or we're going to think about the genes in the pathogen. Okay, so now here, a little different than the last one where we had genetically distinct plants. Here, these are all uh, the same. So maybe all leaves from the same plant or something like that that we're going to use here. So genetically identical. And we're going to infect them with different strains of bacteria. So in the first one, we're going to infect it with bacteria strain A, right? So this is just some, some and so the, the bacteria here, when we say different strains, we're talking about genetically distinct bacteria. So here we see, you know, the hypersensitive response. So this plant is going to be, you know, well, I guess let's let's use our vocabulary here. Now we're talking about the bacteria. So this bacteria is not is a virulent, right? A virulent, not able to cause disease. It causes that localized cell death, but not disease. All right. Then we're going to infect that same uh, leaf from that same plant with uh, strain B, and now we do see uh, disease. And so this one is virulent. And then finally, now this last experiment is one that we would require some genetic manipulation. So this here we're using genetic tools in a laboratory. And what we're going to do is take some DNA from strain A, and we're going to put it into strain B. And rather than just say DNA here, let's just say one gene. So we're going to chop out one gene from the genome of bacteria A, and we're going to insert it into bacteria B. And now you can see that the plant does have the hypersensitive response. So this new strain of bacteria that we've created is now uh, a virulent. Okay. So that gets us to our next learning catalytics question here. Whoops. All right. So I want you now to sort of put these two things together, right? We have some, some genetic evidence from the plant side, and then we also have some genetic evidence from the bacteria side. And so go ahead and just pick what you feel like is the best 
answer that summarizes all of these, feel free to talk to people around you and, uh, uh, and look back over those last couple of slides to pick the best answer here. We almost have everybody. So five, four, three. You need more time? One more time? Okay. Oh yeah, I see some people dropped off and now we're dropping back on. Okay, good. So I don't think it's that hard of a question, but I want to give you some time to look at this. While you're thinking about it, I will say that, you know, what I like about this material uh, for this, this section, even though it's short, it does reinforce some like major concepts from the course. So in a second, we're going to think about signal transduction pathways. We're going to think about response to the environment. We're going to think about protein confirmation. There's a whole bunch of, of key concepts that are that come back up here in this. Also, signaling, hormone signaling through the plant. Okay, how are we doing now? Let's see. Okay, good. Looks like we've got a lot of people responding now. So. Um, good. All right. Almost everybody went with with the best answer here, which is C, right? That there's the genes from the plant and the genes from the pathogen. Both are playing a role in whether or not you get resistance or not. And you know, we have uh, scientists have called this the uh, the gene for gene hypothesis. Basically, this idea that you know there's one gene in the plant that is we got to recognize one the product of one gene in the pathogen. And if that happens, then you get resistance. Okay, so more vocabulary for you. And you've got this all written out on page uh, 38, right? So R genes, R genes are encoded in the plant genome. So, and the R stands for resistance, right? So these are the resistance genes. They're encoded in the plant genome. They encode receptors, right? So these are receptors, and they initiate HR, the hypersensitive response, when they are bound to their ligand, right? So whatever the small molecule is that they bind to, that is going to result in the hypersensitive response. Sorry. Okay. So now we have the ones coming from the other side, what we call AVR genes. So our genes are from the plant. The AVR genes, those are the ones in the pathogen. <laughs> And what these do is they encode the ligands that are recognized by the R gene product of the plant, right? So they make these small molecules or, or large molecules in some cases that the plant receptor is able to recognize. And now typically these are some, you know, like it wouldn't make any sense for a pathogen to, to have a gene to make a product whose only role is to like signal the plant like, hey, I'm here, come and get me, right? That doesn't make any sense for the pathogen. So what these R genes are is they are some other, you know, they, they have some important function for just the regular everyday life of that pathogen. So they might be like, like uh, something that ends up in the cell wall or the plasma membrane or something like that, that is just part of the way this pathogen lives. But if the plant is lucky, it has a protein a receptor, an R gene product that's able to recognize that specific molecule. All right. So just that, that a lot of students are confused like this. Why would why would why would that, you know why would a pathogen make an AVR gene product? You know, and the answer is they make it because they need it to survive, but it just also happens to be recognized by the plant. Okay. So here we can kind of think about what's going to happen here. So here we have the pathogen drawn, and, and you can see in this one here, I made these really obvious little sort of balls sticking off the surface of it. Maybe those are plasma membrane proteins, something in the cell wall of a bacteria or a fungus or something like that. And then here we have the R gene product from the plant. And so obviously, I'm really emphasizing there's this molecular interaction between this little ligand molecule. We'll call this thing here the ligand. And then the R gene. And so if this happens here, we are going to get the hypersensitive response. And this plant is going to be, uh, the plant's going to be resistant in this case. Now, here we have another pathogen. Here we have the same R gene product, but this one, you know, has, uh, doesn't make that little, that little plasma membrane molecule. 
this could be a mutation, right? That this bacteria has had a mutation, so it no longer makes this protein on its surface. And now it's going to avoid the plant's defenses because the R gene won't recognize it anymore. So this is going to lead to infection and disease, right? So I guess I should just go back to our vocabulary that we're trying to use, right? This pathogen here is going to be avirulent. And this one's going to be virulent. So it all kind of comes down to that, right? Does this, if this microorganism, bacteria, fungus, whatever it is, virus, if it makes a little molecule that the plant has a receptor that will recognize and bind to, then you're going to, uh, that, that's going to lead to resistance and bigger synthesis. If not, that pathogen is going to be able to, the, it's going to be invisible to the plant and it's going to be able to grow and take over inside those plant tissues. All right. I like this figure. This is a figure that was in an older edition of the textbook, um, but I think it's kind of helpful. And so I put it up on Canvas for you to look at. It's not in the current edition of the textbook, but it shows up there at the top, the bacteria, the virus, the fungus. We have these nice color-coded little molecules from each of them. And then of course the green things down there represent the, the receptors in the plant, the R gene products. And so we can kind of see you know, which ones are, you know, in this case, the fungus is going to be able to infect because there isn't an R gene that recognizes any sort of molecule on the surface of that fungus. All right. Can I answer any questions? So far, Your Honor? Yeah. Let me emphasize again, like just a big challenge for students I know in 162 is just keeping all of it straight. Okay, R genes, AVRG. A virulent, virulent, resistant, not resistant. You know, that's it's easy to get those things all scrambled up. So just get early on practicing this vocabulary. So as you can imagine, uh, oh, this doesn't show up very well, but there's, um, there are, you know, plants encode a lot of these R genes. So this is a map of all the chromosomes of the Cabernet Sauvignon uh, grape that was uh, sequenced in 2008. And, okay, yeah, so the chromosomes, you can't really see them here, but there's a, you know, each of these represents a chromosome. And so there's the, the, the uh, 19 chromosomes of, of grape. And the red dots on here look, represent the positions of all of the R genes. So you can see that there's lots of different R genes and this is, makes a lot of sense, right? You want a lot of versions of these R genes, a lot of diversity in, in this area because it's gonna let, allow you to recognize many pathogens. And this definitely is an analogy to the animal immune system where there is a lot of genetic diversity um, and lots of different uh, proteins that could be made that help us recognize many, many different pathogens. So it makes sense that plants spend a lot of their genes on these R genes, allowing them to recognize lots of things. Yeah. Is the R genes and the AVR genes, are these target-specific to plants? No, but let's go back to this, because again, this is all new to everybody. The R genes, those are the ones in the plant genome. You know. AVR genes, those are the ones in the, the bacteria genome, you know, right? Everybody's going to have to get that. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So if, you, if we go back to this, right? So this result here, right, it was a three to one ratio. Um, this tells us that resistance in the plant is really conferred by a dominant allele of a single gene. So now we have a name for that gene, we would call that an R gene. Whereas here, if we look at this one, right, this one gene, we have this, this virulent bacteria, or the, the, sorry, the, the strain A, you know, it had a gene, it made a product that the plant was able to recognize. When we take that gene and we cut it out of strain A and we put it in the strain B, which is virulent, then it starts making that protein and that pathogen gets recognized. So this would be an example of moving an A, let's just label this. So here, this is really sort of focusing on an AVR gene. I'll look, I'll look down here, AVR gene. Sorry, that's kind of... So an avirulence gene. Whereas here, you know, this is where we're talking about an R gene is the, the subject of this genetic experiment here. Okay. So then what happens after? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, do animals have R genes? Okay, yeah, so 
Not for yeah. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. No, these are this is all plant specific vocabulary. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I misinterpreted. Right. So when we talk about plants, we're going to talk about the major histocompatibility compatibility complex. This big bunch of genes that all uh, encode different antibodies, and I'll let Dr. Taylor tell you about that. It's really interesting, and of course, really important for thinking about any kind of infection, but especially for thinking about COVID. Okay. So what happens after you get after, whoops, after this interaction takes place. So we're going to think now a little more, a little more detail about the hypersensitive response. So first of all, it starts with the pathogen being detected, right? And so that's when an R gene product binds to an AVR gene product. So that causes a signal transduction uh, pathway that results in a bunch of plant enzymes being activated. So these are enzymes that they're, when we say activated, it just means their activity goes up. And they, that is going to result in the production of a couple different molecules. One important one is nitric oxide, different than nitrous oxide, which is NO2, that's laughing gas, that's different, nitric oxide, and also uh, hydrogen peroxide and uh, superoxide, which is this oxygen molecule with a negative charge. So these are highly reactive, these are called reactive oxygen intermediates. Um, these are very dangerous inside of cells. Well, I guess I'll talk about them in a second. But the, the, nit the effect of the nitric oxide is it causes the cell wall to really sort of thicken and harden. Because remember, one of the things that we're doing here is we want to prevent that pathogen from getting out of those cells and infecting local cells. So the nitric oxide is really interacting with the components of the cell wall to thicken and harden up the cell wall. These guys over here, the hydrogen peroxide and the superoxide, they are what contribute to cell death. So they're going to kill the plant cells that are infected, but they're also going to kill the pathogen that's infecting those cells as well. And, you know, hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, these are, you know, uh, reactive oxygen intermediates, you know, about, you know, having, it's important to have a lot of antioxidants in your diet. Antioxidants are molecules that combat these, right? So just through your cells, through their regular metabolism, they produce uh, hydrogen peroxide and superoxide. And these are just very reactive, very dangerous molecules to have around inside the cell. And in this case, they cause the cell death. Then the other thing that happens, which is important, is that as the cell is dying, it also sends out a signal, a hormone signal to the rest of the plant saying, hey, there's a pathogen in the area and we have to be prepared. All the cells have to be prepared to respond to it. So this is a hormone signal. Right, so if it's signaling to other tissues in the plant, that would be our definition of a hormone. All right, so these are sort of the steps that we, that we talk about the hypersensitive response. This is really what's happening here. All right. So another figure from your book that they took out of your current edition, but that I put up on canvas that I think is very nice. It shows you know, all these things happening. Yeah, um, there's the R gene, there's the pathogen, and over here at the end, we have this sort of thick wall, and basically the whole contents of that cell are now dead, the pathogen and the plant cell both along with it. So you can see this, this figure up on canvas. All right, so if we want to go back here, you got to jump back in your workbooks here to page 34, and you can fill in the, the bottom part. So this is an example. I think that we could can, we can chalk this up as an example of what we call acquired immunity. So first of all, we, we have some questions that we can ask. So what cells are able to do this? And the answer is all cells of the plant. They all are able to uh, evoke, the, to have the hypersensitive response initiated. It's acquired immunity, meaning that this only happens when the pathogen is present, right? It doesn't happen all the time, like the innate immunity is up at the top. And so recognition involves this R gene, AVR gene interaction. The response is the hypersensitive response, cell death. All right, so that is the, the response when the pathogen is detected. And then the last question, which we haven't really talked much about, is it systemic? In other words, does it, is it conferred on just that cell or does it spread to the whole system? And the answer is that yes, it is systemic. And this is what we call systemic acquired resistance or SAR. And again, I have another slide to talk about that here in just a second. But I'll give you some time to copy this down. So this is acquired immunity because it only happens when the pathogen is present and when the pathogen is detected by the plant. 
All right. Or... Now again, it might be helpful to use the, the other side of this worksheet later. We talk about animals, you know, as, you, as you're comparing and contrasting the way that plants and animals defend themselves from attack from the environment. Okay. All right, so let's do another learning catalytics question. Oops, hold on. I'll put it up here and give you a moment to uh, Again, this is all just about practicing the vocabulary. So I know, oops. Uh, sorry. Sorry, got to, I'll let you start thinking about it, but I'll activate the question here in just a minute. Okay. All right, so all about practicing the vocabulary. There's only one statement on here where the vocabulary is used correctly throughout. So give yourself some time, read over it, talk to people around you. Um, look back through your notes and see if you can pick the best answer here. Okay, so again, just practice using our new vocabulary related to plant defense. This will be our last learning catalytics question of the session, by the way. So you can power it down after this one here. Okay, overall, people are doing really well. I think we are pretty much ready to wrap this one up. Um, so let's give 10 more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so I'm going to. Stop delivery on here again. Almost everybody got this one right, which is good because this is like brand new vocabulary. I'm asking you to think about, but C is uh, the best answer. Our pathogen is, is a virulent, unable to cause disease if it produces a protein that is recognized by a plant R gene. So all the other ones got something wrong in terms of either virulent, a virulent, or R gene, a B R gene, something like that. So, um, so again, this was if you missed this one, there were a few of you that did. A reminder to you that this is going to be important vocabulary to, to get straight, and it's better to lose a tiny fraction of a point here than it would be to miss multiple questions on the final or something like that that relates to this vocabulary. Okay, so now this is a figure that's in your book, and uh, it talks about that systemic acquired resistance part of it. So here in this leaf, we see everything we've talked about so far, right? So here we have the pathogen. We have the R gene, the ABR gene product, and this is getting the hypersensitive response. So, so some cells that are infected in this leaf are going to die. But now this talks about the rest of it. So we see this red arrow going out to the rest of the plant. So there's this systemic, so remember systemic acquired resistance, SAR. Goes out to the rest of the plant. <clears throat> Probably, what do you think, xylem or phloem? How are we, how is this thing moving here, would you say, based on, Let's do xylem or how about yeah xylem flow. What do you like for it? Uh, good. See a lot of thumbs down, thumbs down for the flow, right? Um, yeah, so it's moving out of the leaf and it's moving up and down in the plant. It is moving via the flow. Um, and what you can see here is that it induces the expression of genes in other tissues. And these genes are particularly, it would make sense. These are the R gene products and also the genes that encode the enzymes for making things like nitric oxide and those uh, and hydrogen peroxide and those other things that are going to allow these cells to be essentially primed to respond to the pathogen if another cell is infected. So what is the hormone? I'm not going to answer that. You can read about that in your book. There's some nice, like they talk about the emerging evidence for what the hormone is that is uh, responsible for the signal. And so there's some objectives about that. And I'll let you read about that in your textbook.
All right. So here, so far we've talked about just those really small uh, things that want to exploit the plant, bacteria, fungus, viruses, now we're going to talk about some larger herbivores and insect herbivores in particular. So here you have this, you've got this figure down at the bottom of page 39. And um, I'm not going to do this as a learning catalytics question. So I'll just have you do uh, hold up your fingers to answer this one here. Um, but let me orient you to the figures. So we've got tomato plants and we've got caterpillars, right? And in this case, this tomato plant over here is a wild type tomato plant. And this one is a mutant. It's labeled SPR8. That shouldn't mean anything to you. But I'm just saying that this one is it's, it's, it has a one gene missing in this plant. And then down here, we have some caterpillars. And the caterpillars are all the same. They're all wild type. But when it says wild type down here, it means that these were fed. These fed on the wild type. And these over here, they fed on the mutant. And then you have some graphs over here also. So just remember, SPR8 is the mutant uh, variety of tomato here. Okay. So you've got all that stuff. So here's a question that I want you to try and answer. So go ahead and take your time, look at all four of those figures. Uh, and in a few seconds, or in a minute or so, I'll have you put up some number of figures corresponding with the answers. We're not going to do this on learning analytics. Um, okay, just think about it, but don't put your hands up yet. So take your time, look at the figure. I'll put it back up here. Do you have you have all this in the worksheet? So I'll, I'll put the picture up here in case anybody doesn't have the worksheet. Okay. So we're thinking about how a plant is able to respond in this case to a larger herbivore and. Uh, Notice that the mutant has a different response than the wild type. All right, so I'm going to show you. All right, a second. Okay, so now with one, two, or three figures, which of the statements is not true of the mutant, right? So two of these statements are true about the mutant. Which one is not true about the mutant? Go ahead, figures up. One, two, or three fingers if you like. Okay, good. So a lot of people going three fingers here. That's that's right. So so whatever this mutation is, right, if we go back and look at this together, the first of all, I mean, that picture up the top is, is pretty dramatic, right? The leaves have all been chewed off the one of the mutant plant. The caterpillars, even though they're genetically the same, the caterpillars that uh, aid the mutant plant are a lot bigger. Um, and then also we can see some other different responses, especially this thing, PI2, which I didn't expect anybody to know what that is, but you can see that, um, here, this is kind of interesting. This is without the without the the insect, without the caterpillar, and this over here is with the insect. I should have labeled that probably earlier, right? So what you can see is that whatever the stuff PI two is in the wild type, when the when the caterpillar is there chewing on the leaves, it goes way up. But that's not happening in the mutant. All right, so. This is a whole different pathway with a whole different bunch of genes and everything associated with it, but it's this response to especially insect herbivores. Um, so the insect chews on the, the plant. And by the way, there's some kind of neat evidence that it's not just if you just like go up to a plant cell and kind of or a leaf and kind of like crunch it up. Um, this doesn't happen, right? If you just tear a piece off the leaf, it's not going to happen. It's actually uh, uh, the result of like the the um, caterpillar chewing on the leaves. There's some enzymes and things like that in the saliva of the caterpillar that are actually part of initiating this response. So it's it's specific to a uh, insect chewing on the leaves, and this results in the release of a hormone. And so the hormone from these damaged cells, it's called systemin. It's a peptide hormone. And then that's going to travel through the, the plant. 
And, you know, I, I didn't really leave a spot for this here. I just jump right to the second messenger on this one. Um, of course, it's going to bind to a receptor. Oh, yeah, plasma membrane receptor because, uh, you know, this is a, a, a peptide hormone, so it's going to be big. It's not going to be able to get into the cytoplasm by itself, so it's going to bind to a receptor. And since it's a plasma membrane bound receptor, therefore, that's going to initiate a, a signal cascade inside the cell that involves a second messenger, right, inside the cell. And um, the second messenger in this case is a molecule called jasmonic acid. So insect shoes on the leaf, those leaf cells, as they are being damaged, they synthesize this called systemin, which leaves the leaf via the phloem and goes to other parts of the plant. And uh, here, but cells that are able to detect it, um, you know, they have the receptor for it, they make jasmonic acid, and that results in a change of gene expression. And so the ultimate response is the production of enzymes or proteins, which are called proteinase inhibitors. So the response is uh, an increase in the leaf cells of proteinase inhibitors. So a proteinase, and you've, you've already learned about these in the nutrition section of the, the animal nutrition lecture, right? That, that when you eat a meal, you've got lipases that help you break down, uh, you know, lipids and fats. You've got, um, you know, amylases and things like that that help you break down carbohydrates. And you have proteinases, which break down proteins, right? So pepsin, pepsinogen, that whole thing. Those are examples of proteinases. So these are um, breakdown proteins. And you can see here that it, what the result is on these little caterpillars. So the bottom ones were grown, were fed some of this proteinase inhibitor. And what it does is it basically plugs up their digestive system. They're not able to, to break down proteins in their digestive system. They're not able to absorb the amino acids into their, into, into their tissues. And so these proteins build up and eventually they just kind of poison the digestive system of these little caterpillars here. And so this is the way that some plants have evolved this defense against these insect herbivores. They, they detect the herbivore and then through this single transduction pathway, they're able to make a protein which kind of poisons the digestive system of the, the caterpillar. And just to put a little bow on this here, the SPR8 gene, remember I said that the mutants they have a mutation in a gene called SPR8. What it is it's, it's uh, encodes an enzyme that synthesizes jasmonic acid. So this is that second messenger that's important for this response. So these cells, they can still make the systemin, it can still bind to a receptor on the cells, but then the second messenger isn't made, right? So in, in the mutants here, we're kind of eliminating all of this, all these downstream steps.